Hi, welcome to Bad Music Taste and Other Ways to Ruin Your Life. My name is Dominic. And my name is Sam. Dominic has a record this week. This week's record is Candy Apple Grey by Husker Du. This record was first released in 1986, and the copy I have here is the first pressing on black vinyl. Anyways, no we're way. To- <laughs> Anyways, today we're talking to Jeff Nelson from Minor Threat, Teen Idols, and Discord Records. How's it going, Jeff? It's going pretty well. How are you guys, other than having just lost your power recently, just uh, minutes ago? Pretty good. That was a uh, stressful half hour. Normally, we do the interviews from our own houses, and then Sam's power went out, so she rushed over here, and now we're in separate (laughs) rooms. Uh, That's funny. Yeah, definitely a different experience than usual. (laughs) But uh, we, of course, met at the Punk the Capital screening in Baltimore. And in Punk the Capital, you said that you met Ian McKay through Building Bombs. So where does your fascination for Building Bombs come from? Um, I think I met, I think uh, our initial uh, commonality was probably probably more skateboarding but um, and, and music and stuff. Uh, but, um, but certainly he... he um, I think his first memory of me as a, as another kid was um, blowing up some bombs at, at, at high school. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's very strange, very funny. I mean, um, I think about this all the time because uh, I'm a total pacifist. I've got big anti-war signs in my front yard, which lists the, uh, U.S. wounded and dead from Iraq and the Iraqi civilians killed, which is hopelessly out of date because it's impossible to, nobody counts them anymore because they don't count because they're not Americans. So I'm very anti-war, but ever since I was a kid, I've always been fascinated with uniforms and my my main collecting passion at this point is World War I German uniforms from like 1870 to 1918. So not Nazi stuff, but uh anyway i just love the time period the uniforms uh the uh the printing technology for books and stuff it was just graphic design wise and uniforms it's it's a beautiful period visually so uh, was always fascinated with military stuff and um like i said i've I've thought about it a lot over the over the years um I mean, what kid doesn't like blowing, at least most guys, what kid doesn't like blowing stuff up, right? But uh, it's amazing that I never had any desire to go into the army, maybe because I was skinny and was, you know, was usually one of the last chosen for uh, the football or baseball team or whatever. Um, I mean, I could run fast and things like that. But so, <laughs> so it's, so in other words, I think being skinny, and being a geek probably greatly informed my view on lots of things from sports, which to me is mostly a complete waste of time or uh, military stuff. So conceivably also, also I grew up with wonderful liberal intellectual intelligent parents who of course taught me that war is stupid and, and um, uh, pointless. And so you know, it's conceivable that if I was born big and strong, like a football player, then I would have ended up like being a football player and joining the army conceivably. But for whatever reasons, uh, I never, ever went that direction, but still I loved making bombs and stuff. That was always fun. And, uh, just thank goodness nobody got hurt. You know, I still have, I still have all 10 fingers (laughs) and, and two eyes and uh, which is amazing. And there were plenty of times when I, you know, something that I blew up might have really hurt somebody badly at school. So I'm very lucky that that it was just a, a youthful phase. And uh, but but interesting, in other words, if I joined the army, my God, I could I could bl- blow up the real stuff all the time. And maybe they would have I could have gone into weapon development or something. So you know, I can definitely see an alternate path for myself, but, but um, intellectually I could never go there. So. Yeah. And speaking of uh, you collecting like uh, world war one stuff, you uh, got into like, uh, well, wanting to play the drums from seeing the drum corps, right? Yep. Um, 
Yeah, I think, um, yeah, watching um, marching band and um, and the, the fife and drum corps and stuff just was always seemed very exciting to me as a, as a little kid. Because one of the first things I liked, first thing I liked was American Indians. And then it was like patriots or revolutionary soldiers. Although now I think the British you know, soldiers uniforms in the Revolutionary War were much cooler and they weren't they weren't necessarily the bad guys. I mean, they were they were just doing what they were told. And um, we were kind of insane to go up against our mother country and and uh, topple that relationship. Uh, so so that was definitely the first thing that um, would have gotten me interested in drumming and uh as a brief aside and i will try to keep it brief because i'm very good at going off on tangents and getting lost but um it was hilarious because maybe oh at this point 20 years ago i was went to a friend's wedding way upstate new york near the Can canadian border so uh i knew i would be going right near fort ticonderoga which was a, a very important historic fort on the hud on the hudson which just traded hands back and forth during the French and Indian war. And then during the Re American revolution. And um, so it was really fun to see the fort and uh, two, two things I, two takeaways. One was it was um, just eye opening and hilarious and kind of sad because there was a fife and drum corps playing and Whereas before I would have been age you know, third grade, I still have the tri corner that I have from Colonial Williamsburg, you know, and being just impressed by the fife and drum corps in third grade. So here I was, I guess, um, 20 years ago, so late 30s, and seeing basically a pimply faced teenagers who were just clearly just this, this was their summer job and they're clearly bored, bored out of their minds wearing, you know, wigs. And the, and the soldiers' uniforms and playing the fife and the snare drum and just, you know, they're just standing in the sun and for the tourists and you could just tell they wished they were anywhere else. So that was funny to see it from such a different perspective. Uh, and then uh, after I was at the fort, then I went to, uh, I think, Mount Defiance, which is right across the Hudson. And that's where the British soldiers if I have it right, managed to pull, nobody thought you could do it, but they managed to pull heavy cannon up this mountain. So in other words, they were then higher and they could bombard Fort Ticonderoga and the people in the fort realized it was all over. So they had to surrender. Um, but it was amazing because when I was over there, I suppose a good um, mile away, the Fife and Drum Corps were by, at that point doing their second round of the touristy thing for the next group of tourists. And so you could hear the Fife and Drum Corps so clearly from a mile away. It was amazing to, to imagine what it was like, you know, 200 years ago and before that even, just in by the Civil War, American Revolution, just so many wars where bands you know the snare drum they were used and bugles and things were used to give signals and either rally the troops or scare scare people hey we're coming you know but it was kind of amazing to hear how far the music and the sound of the drums and stuff could carry so that was kind of cool um but yes that so getting back to what you'd asked yes the um, military band stuff marching bands would have been my first thing that i was maybe interested in it and then of course just loved the Beatles as a kid. And then um, I forget exactly when I thought, when I started to think, I know by fifth or sixth grade, I thought it would be cool to play the drums, to play a drum set. Uh, sorry, sorry, seventh or eighth grades. But, um, but I felt it was way too late. Like I, because um, there were a friend my age, he played in a band with his brothers and watching them. And I thought it was, you know, clearly way too late for me to start learning drums so that was in afghanistan when we still when we lived overseas but then the next year uh ninth grade uh i was in school the same school which ian's son carmine has now uh started going to and uh during lunch suddenly there was an, an announcement over the pa system 
uh, if anybody wants to take snare drum lessons, you know, we're going to give snare drum lessons at lunchtime. And so I gave up my lunch hour and with a couple other guys took snare drum lessons. And, um, and that's, so in other words, then I was played it, sort of like in a, in, in sports analogy, I would have been like second or third string. In other words, not, I was not the first snare drum player and, uh, we, we would only get to play a little bit, but then, you know, in 10th grade, uh, um, 10th grade at Woodrow Wilson high school, uh, 10th and 11th grade, I was, uh, continued on in the band and, uh, played bass drum and snare drum. And, uh, so that's where then I, I suppose, um, I learned to keep a beat and to keep a steady beat and stuff like that. Yeah. I, uh, I, I I also play the drums. I oh. yeah, my dad was a cool. was a drummer, so there are like baby pictures of me like behind a drum set, um, and it's it's funny. My dad is more of like a a marching band drummer, and less of like a get behind a kid uh drummer and like play along to stuff. But it's funny because I'm the complete opposite. And my grandfather was a get behind the drum set. And really? my dad always says like it skipped a generation. That's funny. That's but, and did your did your dad play in play in bands, even though that was not what he really he, he was, Yeah, he, he like played in other like like cover bands and stuff, but primarily did like snare drum and marching band. Um then there's also the difference of um of and and I, I I still find the term jamming a very cheesy term, but it's <laughs> it's really it's really the only term that I know for um, just playing with your friends and seeing what happens and and um, some <clears throat> I think some people some people are better at that than others, and of course um, the the chemistry of of uh, band makes of course is key to what makes an amazing band is just this um, chance grouping of people who really click musically and um, they, you know, they get along for the most part, uh, at least at the beginning before they want to kill each other later. (laughs) And, um, and so, uh, so I have, um, so I would have to say, then I certainly know with me, with my personality that, uh, and, and I wish it were not the case, but I'm such a perfectionist that um, I am incapable or totally disinterested in just jamming and playing with friends just uh, to get to get behind the drums and play my drums and friends. You know, I haven't touched my drums in quite a few years and friends say, don't you miss it? Don't you miss playing? And why don't you just jam with friends? And be, and just it's it's part of my personality. But in other words, I don't want to do it unless it's really good. And I know that to do it. And so that's the opposite of just jamming and having fun. In other words, you know, I, I know you have to practice at least three times a week to be a tight band and that sort of thing. So, um, so in other words, I think I'm not, a, I, I'm not, I was never a loose player stylistically, n- not at all. I mean, jazzy stuff. There's just so much stuff I could never learn to play. I would really struggle and slow stuff is for me way more challenging than, than the faster stuff like that in minor threat. Um, so I don't know, I I suppose I've had just always had a very, um, focused, uh, just completely focused personality about when I'm playing or, or just whether, um, yeah, when I'm playing or practicing or being in a band is, is, it's kind of all or nothing and not, I wouldn't, I would not be a very good jam jamming partner. Yeah. And I think it's true about like all musicians, like I'll go down to play the drums and I'll have like, like an off day where like, even if I'm playing fine, it just won't sound good. So it's like not Mm -hmm. today, like putting the sticks down and going back upstairs. (laughs) And I think that's definitely true. Yeah. And I feel like no matter what the instrument is like, that's going to be true about like all musicians, but it still sucks. (laughs) But then you get into the something, which I I don't know if it's answerable, 
I mean, I, I don't need to tell you as, as a drummer, I don't need to tell you how many drummer jokes there are. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my brother who plays saxophone, uh, I mean, and, you know, we tease, tease each other all the time, but we, we were explaining to my mom on a, in a Zoom call what, a, what drummer jokes were. And he was saying, you know, there's a plane crash and the guitarist and, um, you know, three musicians and a drummer died, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, but so so there's and there's, of course, just endless drummer jokes. But it but it's also true that and it's, and it's very strange. Um, I'm not um, it's something I boast about, but age I'll be 59 soon. And I still don't know a single musical note. I can hum stuff. I can hum stuff. I can carry a tune. I can harmonize. I've gotten quite good over the years at harmonizing and all kinds of stuff. And, and, and I, in, in my later bands, I really enjoyed um, thinking of uh, harmony parts or backing vocal parts and stuff like that. Um, but as far as the music of the songs, drumming is a very weird profession because you're just emphasizing what the other guys are doing, uh, guys or girls are doing, you know? And it's so I almost don't feel like I'm, I'm part of the music that's going on. It's it's um, I mean, you cannot have a good band without a good drummer if, if it's if it's a, if it's a type of music that requires drumming. I mean, you, you know, you, you'll go nowhere if your front person is not great and charismatic. That's a given. But you cannot be a good band without basically everybody should be needs to be good but if your drummer is not good you're not going to go anywhere either so i think i was a good drummer and very steady beat and which is one of the main things i think that's important i suppose but but it's very strange to feel um you know to be known for playing in certain bands and um and yet uh and i mean i did i i i definitely helped shape songs like saying let's try playing that part on top of this other part or let's let's come back to that part or let's play that part first or let's go up and yeah, i didn't even know the term for octave but it would would <laughs> would you know describe let's go up an octave there or something so i definitely helped shape songs and my band band members were in different bands were very patient in listening to me whistle or hum a suggestion because <laughs> that's all i could do but it's, it's also very strange, basically, to just feel like all you're doing is emphasizing the tunes that others have written. Um, and you can definitely, going back a little bit to what you're saying about jamming, I mean, when I was in the band Three, which was the three guys from Grey Matter, um, uh, it was like basically for me after a couple bands after My Threat. And, um, uh, and I think we would have been a really good band had we stayed together. But... Uh, what the difference between i mean in other words your, your drumming is also often only as good as the material you're given to drum to and the things you're given the riffs that people come up with that you can then go like oh cool and you and you uh, that should be this you know great heavy beat or or wh whatever comes to mind and different drummers will think of different ways to to um emphasize something or to and i and certainly over the years i learned to to, to hang back you know that sometimes less is more and things like that but boy uh it's fun when you're playing in a band where you have great stuff to drum to that's 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 very inspiring is is when um when great riffs are being um introduced and and that, that's really fun yeah and like the yeah I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> the amount of times where like I've told somebody that I play the drums and they're like, oh, well, that's easy. Like the drums are easy. Like they can be depending on how much you look into playing the drums. But saying yeah, that it's, it's a, easy is just scratching the surface to me. Yeah, it's a it's a very simplistic um, uh, d answer or description to, of of. Uh, of what's going on um I, I mean on one hand like i would agree that you are um just emphasizing what what uh what others are playing but i mean you can be good at it or bad at it and you can be 
come up with. I mean, look, you know, look how how incredibly great, um, you know, uh, just great drummers throughout history uh, really stand out because they're they're you know John Bonham and and Keith Moon and um, I mean Ringo Starr is a great drummer. He and that's a whole other topic, but I mean, the Beatles are so amazing and the melodies are so amazing and there's so much going on in just about every song that um, you could, it, people, you know, I can understand how people would say that, that Ringo could have played just about anything and it would have sounded okay because the melodies and the riffs were so incredibly catchy but he was really, really good at um, figuring out the best way to emphasize those songs. So, yeah, I think that's a, an incredible oversimplification, what you, you were saying that that person said to you. Um, I mean, I mean, I, but, but then I will also grant, oh, my God, when I look at, um, and I wish I'd paid more attention when I was in bands. I wish I'd paid more attention, I guess, to watching my bandmates play the guitar or whatever, because... Um, uh, now in a band, if, if there were two guitars going on, sometimes I can tell which guy is playing which guitar, but not, not all the time. And the thought to me of, um, of being able to move your fingers, do, doing, um, all these different things at once. And then my God, if you're singing it at the same time, that's a, that's an incredible skill, but of course, drumming also the more adept you become at separating your limbs and doing different patterns with each limb. That's, that's a skill. I mean, some people just cannot do it. Some people cannot keep a beat. I mean, I dated a girl who was a DJ. She was so into music. She had an encyclopedic knowledge of music. She loved, she had really good taste in music, but she could not even tap along to a song, which blew my mind. How can you not, be able to tap along when you're a, you hear the you hear the drummer tap how could you not be able but she couldn't even keep a beat so that's so there are definitely different skill levels at what it what it takes to be a good drummer that's for sure yeah i, I was gonna say like i feel like i'm almost on the other end of things because i personally play violin but it's like i can acknowledge that drumming isn't easy playing a guitar isn't easy, you know, like things like that aren't simple, even though for me, like you were talking about earlier, not even, you know, really reading notes. It's like, that's what I do. Like I read note to note to note across a page on a staff. Like it's, it's kind of the other end of things, but I can see how they are both difficult in their own ways. <laughs> it was um, when I played in, in high school, um, uh, you know, ninth grade, just taking the snare drum lessons and then and then when that was junior high school and then going to high school and playing um, in the school band and there was a marching band and we, I was in the concert band. So I never did the marching, even though I, that's what I, I liked as a kid. But in other words, we definitely had to read notes, not nearly as complicated as um, musical notes. Ours are just um, quarter notes and 16th notes and hitting, you know, the timpani player he 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 has notes that with he has music with notes in it because there's you hit different parts of the drum and get different tones so us it was just like um oh hello what happened there oh. somebody sorry uh, <laughs> somebody was calling me that was my fault <laughs> oh. um so so uh anyway it was funny and uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because it, it has to do with, with how things, how my career in the school band ended. And I was, I, I'm, I'm sure I was a very frustrating st student, but um, so we were supposed to read the notes. So the kind of stuff that we played was um, Sousa, John Philip Sousa marches. So per, the stuff, the kind of stuff you usually would be playing in a marching band, but we were basically playing it uh, as people filed in to the auditorium for assemblies, you know, and none of the kids wanted to be there. And so <laughs> I'm sure they were just, you know, just waiting for the entire thing to be. So we were just playing while they filed in and filed out basically. So I was, I was really annoyed because I was being very good. I thought, and carefully following 
my snare drum music and, you know, reading the music and playing, you know, flam, paradiddle, uh, playing all the different parts you're supposed to play. In other words, there is there you, you can have written parts, you know, you don't you can either just make it up, which is basically what my friends were doing. The other snare drummer was just making the stuff up and I'm trying to follow the notes and play what it tells me to play for this song and and the whole time the band director is um to my 10th and 11th grade years was slowing down and speeding up which is totally verboten in john philip Sousa music as far as i'm concerned it's, it's supposed to be i don't think you're supposed to speed up and slow down you can go quieter and louder and stuff like that. But um, so the other guys who were just, they never got yelled at by the um, director, the, 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 um, the conductor, because they were just making the snare drum parts up. They were not reading anything. They were just faking it the whole time, but they were carefully watching the conductor to go slower or faster because he, he and whereas I was, probably a, a very annoying but i basically decided to start <laughs> ignoring ignoring what he was and i kept what i knew was a steady beat regardless of what the, the conductor of the <laughs> band was doing which is so not what you're supposed to do that's just completely bucking authority so then the um the conductor or leader whatever he's whatever his title was he basically took me aside later and was you know complaining and saying like what are you doing you're like you're totally not following me and and i was saying and i basically i told him that he had terrible rhythm <laughs> and then I, and then i quit and then i quit the band which is just such a mean thing i mean what a mean thing to say to the, like the conductor or the whatever his title was you know just i mean that's his entire career and here's this little this little shithead in the in 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 tenth and eleventh grade at that point, telling him that he had terrible rhythm. <laughs> I was also annoyed because I had broken. I was on snare drum, and then I broke my arm skateboarding. It was my first time to a skate park. My mom took me and two other friends. Um, they were in the band Un Untouchables, so my mom was just so excited. Her son was finally in a safe place. He was off the streets and she's sitting there reading her magazine or newspaper in the car. And we were at the skate park for 10 minutes and I had already broke my arm. And I just <laughs> went like, er, 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 and I had to go to the hospital. Um, so you remember how when, you broke it? <laughs> oh yeah. I was going up. Uh, um, I don't think I would have been terribly good going the other direction either but basically i was going up a pretty gentle slope and then i was supposed to be doing a kick turn and coming down but i was doing the one where you would be you were facing backwards as you made your kick turn as opposed to facing forwards which i think is I'll, i could have probably executed much much better i think so um i was just never a very good skateboarder i mean i i got a piece of glass in my head and I, I, uh, you know, I had, I had several, several skateboard incidents, but anyway, like as a result of this broken arm, I was reduced in rank and I was back to playing bass drum, which is essential in a band, but it's very boring. And then when my cast came off, he capped me at bass drum. So I was really annoyed at that too. I wanted to go back to playing snare drum. And he kept me at bass drum. So that was also part of why I um, was t annoyed at the band director. So, yeah, uh, but it, um, uh, about skateboarding, Dominic's gotten pretty good in general. Um, mm -hmm. And I know he wouldn't talk about it, but he's really good. And this one, you know, I, I tried my luck at it. And I'm pretty sure the first time that we went to a park together, I literally fell off, like the board fell under me in like seconds and I like hit my head on the ground. And I was like, I didn't like that. You know, I, I was a dumb kid not wearing a helmet. And I was like, that wasn't a good idea, so. 
helmet is really important and but i would say even more important than helmet is, is probably wrist guards because that's how yeah i you know learned the importance of that the hard way uh and this is probably the worst like injury that i had from it there was this like uh i don't know like little brick slope uh or like a planter box probably like a foot off the ground i was like oh it would be cool to get an ollie off of that so mm-hmm. i tried to do that rolling up the slope is probably like this big my board is like this big so i just turn like a little bit uh to the wrong way and my truck gets caught on the brick <laughs> and i go flying off and like normally if you fall in the ground you can like catch with your arms this is just like just straight out <laughs> and i didn't yeah. break my wrist somehow somehow i hate <laughs> i i hate watching those um shows like you know ridiculousness or the the shows on uh, on tv where they sh- they show clips of people um usually doing um dangerous stuff on purpose like jumping off a roof you know into a dumpster or or skateboarding or bikes up oh my god i hate watching the one they crash and they land on their face or because you know i can just I, you can feel I, it I, like <laughs> yeah i can feel it and um <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and the same with tooth accidents. My, oh. my two brothers, my two brothers and I have both had just whole, it's almost like the Nelson family is cursed with like, uh, <laughs> bad, bad tooth luck. And so, uh, we have had bad. So uh, it makes me cringe when, if I watch somebody, uh, you know, c- crashing and landing on their face and then when i see people riding a motorcycle without a helmet or without a jacket i'm like oh my god do you it would you know just can you imagine just your your skin being down to the bone by landing on the pavement like oh my god so well the uh the first day i started skateboarding my my driveway is kind of like sloped so there's kind of a bank so it goes mm-hmm. from like a bank to just flat and i'm rolling on the flat um and then i'm i'm rolling backwards down the bank and i'm like i've never done this this is like my second day skateboarding and i'm going super fast and then i hit the curb and then it was still like wet out in the road so i'm like sliding on the road on, <laughs> that was that was like a your, year ago on your feet or on your body just sliding no like my like i'm like rolling on the, on the road yeah, it's um, well, whether skateboarding stuff or making bombs, like we were talking about earlier, it's uh, it's it's amazing how how um, how many ways there are to get hurt, and how it must be really hard to be a parent and know how easily something can go wrong, and but you you don't want to be a completely controlling parent and you know uh, be annoying, but uh. It's got to be really hard to just be hands off because, you know, the only way to learn how dumb something can be is often by doing it. And then, realize, you know, you can't teach experience. So, yeah. And if I'm like, oh, I just learned this. Mom, look at this. <laughs> the face, uh, like her face every time gets me. She's so and it's so funny to me because I'm like, I just did this. <laughs> but I completely understand as well. This, it is dangerous, even though it's just a plank of wood and some and some wheels. Yeah, well, sh- and showing showing off for others is such a is such a natural thing to do. Yeah, to get attention or to um, impress others or. And, um, it just often leads to, I mean, it lead it can lead to greatness and, 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 um, being a famous athlete and et cetera, but it can all, it just also can lead to disasters, <laughs> you know, just by doing dumb stuff. Um, yeah. I've had my, my share of, uh, of accidents you know, just doing dumb stuff. I mean, d- diving, I remember in front of Henry, um, Garfield's the apartment where he lived um and just uh i guess i was probably nine eighteen maybe 
in the teen idols probably. And uh, yeah, definitely the teen idols. And, and I remember just thinking it'd be funny to basically just dive headfirst into the bush, the bushes, uh, you know, which were nicely trimmed in round shapes in front of his apartment building and dove headfirst into it. Like, and of course, completely just hit a huge branch that just completely whacked my head and cut up the top of my head and I was bleeding and it hurt like hell. I mean, so just stupid stuff like that, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's very, it's very, I feel very, I'm, I'm the opposite of religious, but I feel very blessed to have, like I said, all my fingers and, uh, and to, and, and to still have both my eyes and all that stuff. Absolutely. Yes. Well, uh, well, Jeff, thank you so much for your time. This is a lot of fun. Oh, you don't want to get talk about music or something? I mean, I'm, if you, well, we, we can, can go into minor go. thread. What? Sorry. We can go into minor thread. Yeah. In other words, I feel guilty because, um, I mean, if your schedule permits, I'm I'm certainly happy to keep talking. Uh, Absolutely. I feel guilty because we talked so much about you know, um, marching bands and. Uh, bombs and stuff like that well i, mean, I heard we uh, asked yeah <laughs> I, I heard on this uh podcast with brian baker that minor threat was uh writing a book so how's the book going and did the pandemic <laughs> affect the writing process um well we've been thinking about this book for uh, probably 20 years and um you know in the same same with the discord book eventually we'd like to do a book on minor threat and discord. I mean, so the minor threat one is complicated enough and it'll be hard enough. The discord one, you can imagine just exponentially more complicated because there's so many bands and 40 years compared to like three and a half years or whatever from minor threat. <laughs> um, well, so, you know, I, I would say, I would say we're at the very beginning of working on the book. In other words, um, <laughs> th there is nothing, there's nothing to show for it right now. You know, we have lots of photos and I, I know which I, I can see which photos I think are, are great and should be used. You know, are ones we've never, we've never released and we've saved a lot of stuff for projects such as this. Um, but in other words, we're, it's still so early in the process. There's, it's not about to come out, but that that's a long ways away as, as far as I know. It, it's we're just very very busy. I don't have kids, but I'm still just completely consumed with projects in my house and um and uh, and then Ian's and in just insanely busy. So um, the and the fact that. Um, that the fact that we have decided basically to do it ourselves, the the uh, the putting it together, and the, I mean we, we have a friend that we're going to work with who who does uh, graphic design. Who we we know him really well. He knows us really well. He knows what stuff we are likely to like, and not you know he knows our style, and he knows what uh, he, he has a good sense of of. Uh, minor threat and discord and so so um he we he's gonna help um design it shepherd i mean i would like to just i'm a designer so i would love to just design the whole thing myself but i don't want to be a bottleneck and just slow the project down completely which um which i fear would happen and you know, i just have too many other things going so uh i have never been good at cracking my own whip and that is basically what needs to happen is um, I think we need somebody to crack the whip on us to make this happen. And our guitarist Lyle keeps trying to crack the whip on us, but <laughs> Ian is so incredibly busy. I have been insanely busy. So it's um, finding the time uh, is, is hard and it's, and it's a long process, but that doesn't mean we, we can't, we mustn't keep trying because we, we do, on one hand, I, th I think miraculously um, interest in minor threat and straight edge is not going to go away. Um, I think, I think it's pretty safe to say that there's always going to be continued interest. 
for which we've, you know, I feel very grateful and lucky. And um, I think, I mean, I think we were a good, we were a good band with uh, Ian's obviously very strident lyrics and delivery and stuff like that. But it's still, it's still remarkable that people care about our band so many years later. Um, but it's interesting. You were talking about the pandemic and um, uh, th- that was one of the last things that, that I, and I think the other guys did before the pandemic became really serious was we met to, uh, to talk about, you know, to reminisce and to talk about the book and, and our ideas for it. And that was, um, I guess that was Feb, um, very late February of 2019. So right before, I mean, literally a week later, it was, uh, becoming evident how serious this was going to become. So, um, if the, you had asked, you know, has the pandemic affected it? I mean, I suppose if the, there was no pandemic conceivably, maybe we would have gotten together again in person or something to have, um, and the project might be a little bit further along, but I don't think that's a huge part of the problem. In other words, we live in different cities. Ian lives in the, in, in Washington, DC. I live in Toledo, Ohio. Um, and uh, both Lyle and Brian live in New Jersey. So more likely we would be doing something by having a Zoom call anyway to talk about stuff and work stuff out. So I imagine we will start doing that along with our designer friend to, to, to try to get the ball rolling properly. Yeah, I heard about that on the, like some podcast with Brian Baker a few years ago. Where mm-hmm. he was saying like that was the uh, like you guys got together and then got the picture on the steps and then like the new picture and then started talking about the book. <laughs> yeah. 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 He. Um, yeah, it was funny. I mean, we. I. I had said let's. I. I had suggested that we take a photo because we. Ian, Ian and I always take pictures. We try to take a picture every year if possible uh, of us. <laughs> of us on the side of the Discord house porch. Um, and every once in a while uh, over the years, uh, we have, the, the band has taken a photo there. Uh, and uh, I mean, we, we're not, not going to, we don't go to crazy lengths to try to sit in exactly the same position uh, as we did in the, in the photo from this, cover of the salad days record but um um so we've done that several times over the years but yes it was i think this was the first time that we had done it since the advent of um maybe the internet but certainly places like facebook and instagram and all the places that people would post things and share things because um because I said, hey, let's take a, let's take a photo. And then we took a photo and I didn't know Brian was going to like immediately send it to somebody or post it online. But <laughs> within about 15 minutes, a friend in Berlin emailed me and said, wow, that's a cool photo. You know, so that um, I suppose um, you guys and um, people who have grown up knowing, never knowing a world without compute, without personal computers and iPhones and the internet can't probably can't imagine how crazy that is, but it's, it's, um, it's for us, it's stunning and remarkable that, um, I mean, still most of the world, most of the world has never heard of minor threat has never heard of this <laughs> record. So that having been said, uh, it's amazing then as far as for the people that, uh, have heard of my thread or, and, and thought it was cool. It just inc- insane for something like that to rocket around the earth and in 15 minutes have a friend around the world call and say that they saw the photo is um, it, well, it's a testament to the speed of the internet and um, uh, which has obviously affected governments and um, societies, you know, in, be, be, <coughs> because it's changed communication so much 
Um, yeah. And I think, and sorry, and I think the number of people that come, this was definitely affected by the pandemic because no people were not traveling, but the number of people that would travel from around the world to go and find the discord house and either just look at it or ask, Hey, is there any chance we can sit on the front porch and take a picture? Um, that has Ian said that that has increased exponentially because of the internet. Um, because, um, you know, people just love to take, say, Hey, here's a picture of me at this. Here's a picture of me eating my food. Here's a picture of me at the discord house. And then they put, you know, they post it online and, uh, seemingly, um, their lives would not exist if they were not posting it and telling everybody about <laughs> everything they're doing all day long. So um, to us older people, it seems kind of funny and to be constantly uh, documenting and broadcasting what you're doing at all times to the entire <laughs> world. But, 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 but the fact that that is now a thing and quite common has led to a lot of people posting the pictures of like, Hey, here, here's the discord house and it looks, you know, it's overgrown, but it looks the same. And, and that <laughs> is, I guess, I guess has then just spread and more and more people decide that they want to make that they may, they want to make the discord house a stop on their, on their uh, vacation and take a photo or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, um, I've heard, Oh, I was, oh going to ask one more thing <laughs> so i've heard about the distribution of minor threat records but what was the recording process for the albums like um well uh i don't know that there, that there was anything uh u- unique or remarkable to um i mean i i would I'll, I'll be happy to describe it as best i can but i don't think i don't know if there's anything that's going to stand out <laughs> The only thing I would say is that um, I think we benefited, like for, for me, the first minor threat record, um, which is the, fir- the first seven inch record and the second seven inch record are the best sounding in the, to, as is the case with, it seems like 90% of the bands that put out records, their first record is often their best record. You know, sometimes they can keep making great records, but usually there's a just a purity and a a vision and it just it's so focused and just it, it's in its purest form in that first record. Um, or sometimes the first demo tape, you know, like sometimes a demo tape will really capture the band sounding its best. And then they record it again, trying to make it sound really good. And it actually doesn't sound as good as the first demo thing. So that's a thing sometimes. So I was going to say that I think we benefited um, unknowingly from the fact that we were, I mean, I, I'm not going to say we were poor. We were definitely not rich, but we were, um, you know, we were, I mean, we were privileged kids with, uh, came from nice, nice homes with, with parents with good jobs and well-educated and, um, but in other words, there, uh, the only way the teen idols are our pr- prior band for Ian and myself, the only way we were able to put out our seven inch, which became discord number one was because we had saved up $600 from playing shows and being paid, you know, $40 here and $80 here. And, and we were, um, well, I don't think we probably ever made $80. That would have been insane, but you know, we just were, were frugal and saved up our money and, and that, and so, Similarly, um, n- none of these early Discord bands had lots of money, and um, and so it's not like we could have. In other words, there was definitely sixteen and twenty-four track studios available if you had tons of money. If you were on a major label, or if you had, I suppose, if you had incredibly rich parents, you could. We could have gone into a fancy studio that would do all the stuff, um, but we didn't have the money. And I think, thank goodness, because um, Don Zentera, the um, owner and um, main engineer at um, Inner Ear Studios, um, which is unfortunately you know, going to be closing at the end of, April, of October. Perhaps you've heard that, but he's, 
he's sort of being Ar- Arlington County has sort of, I think, foolishly kind of helped him make up his mind as to what the next stage of things is going to be because they want to buy the building where you know your studios is and and um so but he had a four track machine so in other words his equipment was quite primitive he was doing the best he could i mean he's older than us he was probably he might have been 30 maybe when we were 18 but um so he had the best equipment he could get but he was not rich so his stuff was four track uh, a four track tape recorder. So that's the kind of stuff like when the Beatles first started out. And uh, I mean, the Beatles were is my, will always be my favorite band, always be Ian's favorite band, similar to Lyle and Brian. I mean, just hugely influential to just multiple generations of bands that we listen to all kinds of music, but I mean, at the root of it, the Beatles were just so in such an influence. So when they started out, they were also playing, um, essentially recording stuff live. Sometimes you'd come back over and, and, and add a, a guitar solo over something, but usually John and Paul would be at the mic for, and it's beautiful looking when you see videos of them playing shows and stuff, you know, George, George and Paul at one microphone, uh, it helped that Paul was left-handed, so his bass is facing the other way. But, you know, they're, they're looking at each other, sh- sharing a microphone and both playing and sh- singing harmonies into the microphone at the same time. And that's essentially what they did in the studio. Uh, l- later, of course, they went to, <clears throat> I think, 8-track. And also they did a lot of stuff. And we did some of this where you would, um, since you only have four tracks, you have to decide, okay, well, first we're going to record the guitar and the bass and the drums on three tracks. And then we're going to, it's maybe you've heard this stuff, but it's called bouncing. Then you're going to um, set the level between those three tracks of the drums and the bass and the guitar. And maybe it's just like the, the first guitar layer. And you set the level between those three and you play them and record them onto the, the one track that you didn't use that was empty. So then suddenly you have the recording of the bass and the drums and the guitar on just one track. And, um, and, it's, and, and, the, the, and it's fixed. In other words, once you've done that, then that's how they're gonna sound. You can't, you can't raise the sound of the drums or the, lower the sound of the bass or the guitar. They're fixed to, in relationship to each other. You can turn the whole volume of that track up and down. But in other words, once you've done that and you think you got a pretty good mix of those first three that you bounced into one track, then you have three tracks to play with again. You know, one of them is used up, but then you can record vocals separately if you want to, or if you didn't record that at first, because then you can, and then, you know, you can do a guitar solo or you can add a second guitar track or backing vocals and things like that. So, in other words, there was, um, I think we benefited greatly, as did so many bands, by being forced to, um, the limited technology forced us to do certain things um, more economically, rather than having all the money to, okay, first we're going to play the bass and the drums and the guitar, and everything's being recorded separately, completely isolated. And, and you can use it later completely separate from everything else. And you're going to get the drums perfect sounding and they'll take up six tracks. And then you later have all these tracks you're mixing together. You know, that can be fantastic. And some of the best sounding records in the world were made that way, you know, huge hits. It's not at all uncommon for them to take like one month to mix one song, which we would laugh at, but that's also... <laughs> That's also how you make some amazing sounding uh, records. I mean, so um, I think we benefited in hindsight. I think we benefited greatly by the fact that we uh, didn't have money. And that's, I think, for instance, why the first minor threat record sounds really raw. Is Lyle got a great guitar sound. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we got, a, I think, a good drum sound and a good bass sound. And, and we... Uh, 
for all intents and purposes, essentially just recorded it live with a, with a little bit of uh, recording something later on top. Like I said, using the trick where you can bounce tracks together and then you have freeing up tracks to do more stuff, but still very, very limited options. And I think sometimes you can get the best results that way. And, and then Don upgraded to eight track. And of course we did some stuff there and then, and then it was on to 16 track. And, um, so, um, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, pros and cons to, to both. In other words, it's fantastic having more tracks, but I personally get paralyzed by having too many options. I get par paralyzed. I'm really, can be really bad at making decisions and I'm such a perfectionist. It's really bad. So when you have 16 different tracks or 24 that you can set the exact level between all of those just think of how many more infinite possibilities there are as to how something's going to sound and like, well, is it, I don't know, should we do, should we, you know, should we do another mix and make it sound better? It just, uh, it can, it can make it take for, end up taking forever when you, and so that is, um, the band starts to get on each other's nerves when it takes days and days and days to just agree on like what it's going to sound like. And it also costs money to be in the studio for days and days and days. Um, that was what was so incredibly cool about the Beatles. If, if one likes the Beatles is by a certain point, they were so popular and so important to the record label that they just essentially just kept the tape recorder running the whole time. And so that's why you can hear them recording their, this or that famous song 10 times in a row and you get to hear well if you buy bootlegs and things like that you can hear all these different versions where they're figuring out the best way to do the harmonies and and to make the song work which is not which is something you usually don't get to have because nobody can afford that kind of studio time of course i see, I see you looking at your clock or something of course now with home studios and being able to stop do stuff in in one's bedroom essentially all of these limitations are gone in many ways. In other words, um, you know, you can produce um, an amazing thing. If you, if you have all your equipment and you take your time, you can make something in your bedroom that sounds like it was made in a big studio. Um, so it's uh, maybe I'm going too far afield from your original question, but, but um, people have certainly asked over the years, how do I think like the internet has changed being in a band or putting out records or distribution. And um, I suppose my answers are probably pretty um, going to be pretty obvious, but in other words, on one hand, it's made it uh, it's incredibly easier. It's much, much easier to be in a band now and have your music heard around the world. You know, technically I could place, play something and put it on post it on the internet and somebody in Uzbekistan or Bulgaria could listen to it tomorrow or, and vice versa. <clears throat> so in that sense, it's far easier to get heard than it was. Conversely, there used to be the, the hurdles that it took, you know, the effort that it took and the money and the drive to put out a record, um, I mean, there's a lot of bad records out there. So just because somebody put out a record doesn't mean it's good. But the fact that they, um, either they just had a lot of drive or somebody at a record company thought they were good enough to put out their record really kind of separated the wheat from the chaff. And, um, and now good luck getting noticed because there are, you know, I mean, how many down, how many bands do you think have their stuff out there online now? Like um, a million, half, half a million. I mean, just so many bands. So uh, you can distribute your stuff and have people hear it more easily than ever before. But getting noticed, I would say, is probably almost impossible now because um, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. So yeah, again, and like. Like you said, like, it's so easy to be like, 
discovered all over the world. Like, uh, we have this uh, like program that we can see where people like oh listen yeah to the podcast, and I'll check it every once in a while, and it's like somebody's listening in Australia, like because we're based out of Baltimore, and it's like how did we reach Australia? It's cool. And that's it's crazy to me. Even just like another state is crazy to me because there are listeners like in California, which like is in the same country, but is still insane. Yeah. To me. yeah. I mean, you think about the distance between us and them. And I, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with the fact that it's so much easier to get your music out there and get, you know, like your message out, but it's really hard to get people to listen and for them to hear it because it's like you pretty much have like the one person or a couple of people that really blow up and just take off and you know for them it's a little bit easier yeah. but it's a matter of getting people attracted to what you were producing because it's so much more like it, it yeah it, it's yeah. crazy <laughs> and for and for um and for I, I i think it's probably equally applicable to bands and record labels but um uh You know, I think w- there there is there is no substitute for word of mouth and grassroots support, which is uh, way slower than blowing up, like you just said. Uh, it's way slower, but it lasts. In other words, you, you know, act, real fans care about the band, and they they will um, e- eagerly wait for the next record or same, and if they think a record label is great, then they, they will have a, f- a certain amount of trust that the, the, the next record is going to be good from this label. Um, whereas if you, in other words, I think it would be kind of um, scary, uh, exhilarating, but scary to be in a band that, that, um, just got huge nowadays over the internet and um and was ru- essentially ruling the world for a, for a brief amount of time but then good luck staying on top of it and and then um you know probably it's probably incredibly deflating and hard on your ego to be think think you're so amazing and then and then um there there was a there was a um I don't know if this will be that interesting, but maybe not 40 years ago, but probably, but at least 35, 36 years ago, in other words, when, when discord had been putting out records for three or four years at that point, um, we were well aware of the difference between the, the American music press uh, and the British music press uh, in England, it was uh, far more established. There was NME, which New Musical Express, and um, uh, and another one which escapes me right now. But there were there were um, big weekly music magazines. Um, the and uh, over here, you always had Rolling Stone, and of course, who they they were not going to be interested in the kind of music we were doing that any attention at all from Rolling Stone and things like that only came after the Nirvana Nevermind record as as I'm sure you know that really just opened the industries and the um, American music press's eyes to this uh, other previously um, dismissed genre but in other words um, the British music press was so. This is a, this is in the early to mid '80s. Was um, you know Billy Idol? I mean, Generation X, his amazing first first band, well, or his big band before he went solo. Um, there were all these bands that would um, be huge. It, it was like the flavor of the month. Um, you know who was huge this month, and um, and. Uh, and they'd be pretty famous and all over the front pages of these different music magazines for a couple months. And then they would kind of fade and it'd be somebody else's turn to be f- famous. And um, so I, I, I think it would have been, I mean, our, our band was never 
um, uh, viewed as a famous band. We were never on the front page of any of these magazines. So I think we probably would have enjoyed it if they had um, thought that we were great and had us on a front cover or something and wrote a big article about us or something. So we were basically viewing this from a distance, but um, we were well aware of the fact that um, as cool as the uh, press that these bands uh, that they were getting was, as cool as the press they were getting was, it was also just, um, you know, people and the media paying attention to you one month and then that, the next month they don't care about you at all, as opposed to, um, like I said, the grassroots support and um, American fanzines over here, which were, there were a few um, more national, but there were very few nationally distributed um, magazines or fanzines that talked about punk at all. There were more regional ones um, like Boston and LA and uh, San Francisco and, and New York certainly. And so um, they, I think they, um, and, and then fanzines especially, which were just hu hugely influential and, and hugely important, you know, radio stations were hugely important and DJs, for playing records that, you know, nobody heard like, check out this great new record from the, these guys in DC or this band in from New York. And, and then the same with fanzines, it was, you know, this, this is long before the internet. So this is how you heard about bands from other parts of the country. And this is how you, if you were going to go try to play, play shows in other States, which was a, a big undertaking, um, this is maybe how you would find out what the names of the clubs in these towns were and the, the, the telephone numbers or the, who, who owns the club and who do you talk to and what are some cool bands in that town that you seems like you'd probably have some stuff in common with. And, you know, you try to talk to them and you help them get shows when they come to your town and vice versa. So, um, so those were all things that were um, very much facilitated by fanzines as as a as a national network of support for bands and stuff very slowly grew but as it as it grew i think it um i mean a lot of the bands didn't stay together long enough maybe to make much use of it my thought was didn't stick around for very long and i think fugazi stuck, uh, was probably together for three times as long um so um who, who knows how much use it was if you didn't, if for your band, if you didn't stay around to make use of it. But I'm just saying that I returned to saying that the grassroots support and the slow build of a fan base is really what you want to try to get going. And um, I just returned to what I was saying is I definitely sympathize with any artist or musician now who's trying to get noticed on the internet because you've just got so much competition. Um, you know, and everybody's trying every trick in the book to get noticed. Um, so basically your stuff has to be quality and it has to be good. And then you hope that eventually people will um, hear it or see it if you're a visual artist and pay attention to it. Yeah. Cause you look at like these pop stars who like blew up on, on the internet, but are constantly like fluctuating with relevance. Um, like it's not the same. You can have 3 million fans who don't really care about you, or you can have like 50 people who love what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to. <laughs> right. And then the other thing is like talking about the competition levels is it's growing every day. Like there's no pause yeah. in time where there aren't new musicians trying to make what they want to do and so it, it's the competition is just growing and like i mean it's great that you know there's yeah, so much I, music yeah <laughs> I, I i think i personally i think i find it overwhelming in other words um it's amazing what the internet has brought um like you know like i said i collect world war one stuff i couldn't possibly find add, add to my collection if it weren't for the internet and ebay and um stuff like that and 
so I realized that, that there's all kinds of opportunities that it has provided, but, um, for me at least, um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old fuddy duddy at this point compared to, you know, when I was in my teens or twenties, I I'm well aware of that, but, but still, you know, my brain can only handle so much stuff, so much, there's only 24 hours in a day. You're sleeping a certain portion of that. You, you, you're probably going to have some favorite music that you're going to listen to a, a fair number of times, the old favorites that you maybe come back to. And so there's only so much, and then you got, there's movies you might want to watch or reading books. So, um, I, th I think it's a bit exhausting to have all of the bands in the world at your fingertips at all times. I mean, I, um, I don't know what you feel about the music scene in Baltimore, you know, all, all the different types of music scenes. I would imagine that compared to smaller towns in the middle of nowhere, it's incredible all the stuff that's going on in Baltimore and where I live in Toledo, which is, you know, an economically failing city. Um, <laughs> I, I, I suppose that Toledo is viewed as a really happening place if you live way out in the sticks. Um, but um, I, I, I don't know. I just, I would find it exhausting. Like, um, <clears throat> I don't know. I'm, ra I'm rambling, I realize. But like in New York or Los Angeles, I think of those cities as having just probably the most, this is pre-pandemic stuff, but this is probably having, you know, just the, oh, somebody turned themselves off again. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I just think, think of, of, of bigger cities that have just no shortage of, uh, of clubs and every night, like if you look through this city paper or something, even though that's people don't even read the city paper in as much as they used to it. Now they just, everything's online. But, you know, if there's, <clears throat> If there's like um, 30 options of bands you could go see that night, I, th I, think, I think it leads to jadedness. And for me, it leads to, to um, overwhelmedness. Um, and that was one, <laughs> that was one, you turned, you went blank again. That was one thing that I always... <laughs> Is that somebody, sorry, just, I, somebody I, keeps I, calling in? Yeah, as you know, um, I'm at Dominic's house right now. And it's my mother calling me oh. repeatedly. <laughs> sorry, mom. Um, so uh, I'll <laughs> just, just, that's funny. You want me to talk to her? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, one, one moment. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, I was just going to, I was going, going on a little bit much, but, um, uh, I think one of the things that the DC scene back then, meaning early eighties benefited from uh, was, um, and this has been said ad nauseum. It was, pro I probably said it in Punk the Capital or something, but uh, the fact that it was, um, you had the fact that it was not a huge music town meant, and meant that you as an audience member had to really seek out stuff you had to seek out shows and seek out bands because there were not 30 things going on at every night there were four or six different things going on uh, of all different kinds of music and um so, so in other words i think the i often think that the certainly within a music scene the fewer shows you have the the more uh focused your audience is going to be and the more dedicated uh the support of a club or a band is going to be when when <clears throat> you have less to choose from you know because I, I think i think it's easy to get spoiled by choices in bigger in bigger cities and so to me the internet is kind of the same thing it's just the options are endless the, there's an amazing Devo song, you know, Devo, just such an incredibly great band from Ohio. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and they have, you know, um, 
freedom, freedom of choice is what we got. Freedom from choice is what we want. So I think they're, um, they're being kind of tongue in cheek, but it's, but it's, for me, it's true. Like in other words, uh, having, having too many choices is, um, I think leads to, uh, laziness or, or, um, taking things for granted. And, and also, um, I just get paralyzed by options. I mean, in other words, we grew up and this is a, maybe a dumb, boring example, but when we grew up as kids and teenagers, there were three TV channels. So it was not very hard to decide what to watch and whether there was anything worth watching on the TV. And now, you know, and I don't have any, I have never had a, cable or satellite package that has 200 channels or something i mean i know there are ridiculous options out there but but it's amazing how even when one does have like 40 or 50 channels one can choose from and and years ago that would have been endless amount of entertainment to have that many channels to choose from now you're like surfing like nah no, nah, no, nah, that was kind of boring. I don't know. And just, it just leads to constant, you know, flipping between the channels because there's too many choices. So. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> this is a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, thank I hope, you. I, oh yes. Hello. How, how's your mom? <laughs> I think she, I think she's out front. So <laughs> I'll, I'll tell, I'll tell her you say hello. Yes. <laughs> Tell her she has a fine daughter who's who's uh, up to no up to no trouble. Um, <laughs> at least not tonight. Um, yeah. Well, no, I had I, I had fun. I mean, I I think I I I can be pretty good at rambling. So I don't know. If, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are so many people. We'll have them on, and they're like. Oh, whoops, I just went on a tangent. And we're always like, that makes our job easier. And it's what we want to hear. Like, we enjoy hearing everything. And like nobody <laughs> likes an interview where, uh, where the interviewer talks more than the interviewee. Oh, right. yeah. And, I, and, I've, <laughs> and I've been in some interviews like that where, where, like, on the radio. And I can just tell that the listeners, they don't want to hear all the stories from, this, <laughs> from the DJ that, the whole point reason you had me on the show was because they want to hear from me and but you can't you know how how can you tell somebody that politely to be quiet um <laughs> uh so no i had fun and um i i am honored to be part of your podcast and i wish you continued success and um good luck with your drumming and your violin playing thank, thank you so much <laughs> violin is an, an amazing instrument very cool it's pretty awesome <laughs> All righty. Well, take care. Stay safe. Yes, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.